When I first read Death and the King's Horseman, uh, as an undergraduate student myself, I really was really taken with it. But I quickly became disenchanted with the ways that it was being read by the people around me. And there are two very narrow ways of looking at it. The first and most narrow, I think, was a kind of examination of the details of Yoruban culture and to say, well, this is what this would mean in that culture. That's what that would mean in that culture. And all that was informative uh, and in some ways, I think, very helpful. But at the end of the day, doesn't do anything to explain why this would be of significance, you know, outside Nigeria or outside West Africa, why this would have significance elsewhere. The other, I think, very narrow reading, uh, which is unfortunately, I think, the most common uh, reading in academic uh, circles now, is that is a very sort of strictly political colonialist reading. Uh, that this is about colonialism, that the Pilkings are the villains, though villains out of ignorance, uh, and that this is basically about the power dynamic of colonialism. But I think that is, aside from being extremely reductive, doesn't really get at what is, I think, central to this, ad, uh, to this for an individual member of the audience. If you want to go in and have a kind of gross, uh, I guess, uh, 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 preachy or didactic experience with Death and the King's Horseman, it's possible. I mean, you could very easily uh, consider, for example, um, putting forth a production of Death and the King's Horseman that would be very, uh, very didactic, very preachy uh, in its way of presenting it. So, for example... Uh, I saw a uh, production a few years back of Antigone that was trying to make a political point about some contemporary events that were really, I think, uh, not only not, uh, actually, obviously not in the play, uh, they were several thousand years out of place, but actually got to the opposite of the more subtle ideas that the play was putting forward. Uh, in, in my view, anyway, because that play has staying power because it's not about a particular moment or about a particular political system, but about much more deeply human issues. And I think the reason that Death and the King's Horseman is so moving uh, is more than political issues or the specific cultural issues, but has more to do with broadly the way we humans deal with one another. And specifically about the way that our rituals govern our lives and the way that we don't understand the rituals in one another's lives, not just rituals from other cultures, but more broadly. So as we go through this, we begin really with two sort of ritual dances. Um, and there's a lot of focus if you sort of go online, start reading people talking about the meaning of the dance uh, that Ellison is doing and the community is doing around him, the meaning of this. But I think it's important to note that when we see the Pilkings and they are wearing these masks and they are dancing, uh, the dance that they are doing is the tango. And what might not be immediately obvious is that the tango is not a European dance. The tango uh, really comes from South America. There were kind of two big uh, categories of it. You'd call the the, uh, uh, the Argentine, it used to be called the Argentine tango and the, the North American tango. But the tango has, I think, two importances to it. One is that 
already by dancing the tango, you see that that the Pilkings are um, are involving themselves in something which uh, has a kind of other cultural root, but now has sort of moved in to become a more broadly international dance. The other thing is the tango is a very intimate dance. It's this kind of back and forth uh, where the two partners have to really work together in a very intimate way to make the tango work. Uh, now, of course, all dances, all partner dances should have that, but the tango is one of these that is very important for this. And the tango, in a sense, when we see the Pilkings, we see what would be the ideal of two cultures, right? Two cultures uh, coming together and dancing together. And in some ways, the tragedy that occurs here is a result of these two cultures, each one not understanding the other's part in the dance that they're doing. And so as we go through this, we see the various rituals. I think it's very easy for, uh, for some audiences to really see the exoticism of the Yoruban culture. But I think what people often miss is the way that the culture of the Pilkings is also exotic in its own way. It's exotic in the place that they are. So let me give you an example about how these rituals govern our lives and can be very easily misunderstood. So I've traveled a lot. I've spent a lot of time in other countries and maybe the most uh, socially stressful moment for me uh, when I'm traveling for another country is the first time that I eat with someone from that country. Not just the first time I eat, the first bite. And the reason this is stressful uh, for me, and normally I just have to, if the culture allows it, I just have to directly ask the question, is that in some cultures it is considered appropriate for the host to eat first. The host begins eating and thus it's time for everyone. You know, the host takes the first bite and everyone begins eating. In some cultures, it's appropriate for the guest to begin eating and everyone will, will wait until the guest begins eating. Uh, and of course, even some other cultures, there are other issues like uh, it's appropriate for the person of the highest status to begin eating first or the oldest person to begin eating first. There's often in these sort of uh, things a kind of ritualized sense of who should eat first. And you could really step on someone's culture if you don't, uh, if you don't do that. So, for example, here where I live, it's customary for, uh, uh, for no one to begin eating uh, in a, a kind of uh, intimate setting until someone has said grace, until someone has, has uh, uh, prayed to thank God for the food. And, uh, you know, even in, in, in my own culture where sometimes you'll have someone who's from a much more secular household who will attend, who will go to somewhere and they'll just begin eating and then someone will begin praying and they will get that look of, oh, oh, oh I have offended here by, by my behavior. And that's a very simple thing. Uh, but there are very many ways in which we have all these little things our own culture, our own rituals, whatever culture we're from, whatever our rituals are, we think those are normal. And constantly we are negotiating these. And just like we have masks that people are putting on here, we have, we're putting on masks and taking off masks and we understand what those masks mean. We understand the dance. We understand the tango. We understand whatever, the, what, whatever this is. And those around us often don't. Uh, fun conversation that I have had many times uh, with some of the foreign students who've come to America is dealing with the issue of uh, what's called tailgating. In American culture, often at sporting events, uh, outside the sporting events, people will uh, cook food outside. They'll grill, they'll barbecue, they'll enjoy uh, something outside before they go into the sporting event often for hours or in some cases entire days, they'll, they'll spend a whole weekend doing this. They will do what's called tailgating. It's called this because on pickup truck, you can lower the tailgate and it gives you a kind of uh, space to cook on. Though we call it that whether you're using that or you bring a table or, or, or whatever method you're using, we still call this tailgating. And I've often had uh, 
foreigners who were very surprised to find why are they eat why are they cooking this outside why don't they cook it at home uh, why are they all standing around this truck eating why don't they go sit in those chairs over there and eat uh, and they don't understand the the the, the custom of this and and how this is in some ways considered a ritualistic part of the same event. Now that's an easy one. Uh, that's one where you'll have a moment of social uh, of, of social misunderstanding, but there's also some hard ones. Uh, so for example, there was an incident of uh, some years ago where I invited uh, I invited a graduate student to go to, a social event um, and I didn't think anything of it you know I knew it was a thing he would enjoy I invited him to go to it uh, and when we arrived he suddenly got his eyes got really big and he said I, I can't I can't go in and the reason for this was that the social event uh, was in a church and he was Muslim and was afraid of being seen and thus incurring shame on himself and presumably shame on his family as well by being seen in this church, even though the event itself was not a particularly religious event. It's, it's customary, you know, in, in America, especially in small towns where uh, there are not a lot of large places to hold the social events to hold them in churches. They are considered public buildings and so uh, but for him this would have incurred shame and when I and I, I put him in an awkward position where he had to choose between potentially incurring shame for his family by being seen at a church but also having the problem of uh, dealing with having a professor who has power over him. Now, he was not in my program, so I didn't have that kind of direct power. But a sense that I was a very high status person compared to his status. And he now had to not, uh, he had to, to reject my invitation, not even at the moment. He couldn't make a, an excuse. We arrived and he realized he was in this terrible bind. And I put him in this terrible bind uh, without thinking about it because it hadn't occurred to me uh, that because it was not a religious event we were going to, it hadn't occurred to me that the fact that the event was being held in the church was going to be a problem uh, for him. Uh, when we see this here in Death and the King's Horsemen, we see how this can occur in this kind of explosively tragic way. But there are many ways in which this happens in our daily lives, where we have rituals in our lives that are... Uh, different from the rituals of other people. And when we see the rituals of others, we often find ourselves misunderstanding what those rituals mean, even within our own culture. And I think when we see something like Death and the King's Horseman, yes, we can think about foreign cultures. Most of the examples I've given here today have been the examples of cultures that were not my own uh, or dealing with people from other cultures who are surprised by uh, the American culture that I live in. But there are rituals in our own lives which are important in the way that we respond to one another. So even if you live in a situation where you almost never run into someone who comes from a completely different national culture from you, certainly the people you know have different rituals. So let me give you one other example uh, from my life. My parents are both from America. And in America, we have Christmas trees. These are kinds of trees that we have inside to decorate our houses. And there are many ways that we decorate the Christmas trees. And one way is to put something called tinsel on the tree. And tinsel is a kind of, a, you know, a, I guess, shiny metal that you hang on the tree. Uh, and many little strands of this. Well, in my mother's family, they would hang the tinsel one strand at a time to give it a broadly shimmering look. In my father's family, they would hang the, the tinsel in clumps in different uh, uh, groups to give the tinsel a sense of this is a single icicle on the tree and it's supposed to look like icicles on the trees. Well, when my parents first married, and I, I, I kind of remember this even from when I was really little, they would get in these 
bitter arguments about the tinsel on the tree, how the tinsel was to be hung on the tree, because my mother insisted that it be hung one strand at a time, my father in clumps. Now, this seems like a silly thing to argue about and really to have very emotional arguments about. So why were these arguments so emotional? Those arguments were so emotional because they were about the rituals. And when my mother saw my father didn't do it the way that she did it, it wasn't just you're doing it wrong, but in some ways you're not doing it the way that, that my family did it is showing that you don't respect or esteem my family. My father seeing the way my mother did it had the same response. Now, I doubt either of them consciously thought those thoughts. All they thought was you're doing it wrong and probably never did understand themselves. I mean, they're both alive at this recording, but uh, never, I, I would suspect even on this day, probably themselves don't understand why they would have this argument. And so I remember my father, uh, I was very young, my father banning tinsel, saying we will not have tinsel on our tree. We cannot, essentially saying we cannot have this ritual because this ritual interrupts the tango or interrupts the dance of our family. And so if you were to come to my home today uh, on at Christmas time and you see my tree, my tree has no tinsel on it. And my tree has no tinsel on it to honor my parents. Now, if someone came in and wanted to put tinsel on my tree, I wouldn't be offended uh, by that. Um, it would be strange to come to someone else's house and put tinsel on the tree, but uh, it wouldn't offend me. Uh, but the absence of tinsel, that is itself a ritual that says something about my family history, who I am, and the way in which uh, my uh, in way, way in which my family values the unity of that family. When we look at Death and the King's Horseman, then you can look at each individual thing and you can see ritual after ritual after ritual that each side is doing mostly, uh, mostly, uh, obviously because of the setting, the urine rituals that are misunderstood by those around them, uh, and often are held either in low esteem or in horror by the Europeans that, for example, uh, that he would kill himself, right? The stakes here are very high, which is why the emotions have to be very high, but it gets at this thing that although you and I will probably never experience anything uh, of this kind of depth. Death and the King's Horseman does examine the way in which we in our own lives are constantly trying to negotiate these rituals as we deal with other people and the ways in which we're unaware of the importance for ourselves of our own rituals.